Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of the Business Events Podcast, a podcast that will host interviews and discussion panels with experts from the business events industry and academia. I am Monica Martins, and today my co-host, Xabi Villares, and I will interview Tamara Bernstein, the ICC Europe Regional Director. The ICCA is the International Congress in, Con in Convention Association, which is the global community and knowledge hub for the international association meetings industry. Managing over 500 members, uh, Tamara started working for uh, the ICCA in the midst of the COVID crisis, quickly adapting to new formats and business models, as well as providing knowledge, content and education to our members and collaborating with other regions within ICCA to create a new hybrid platforms. Tamara previously worked for Expo Tel Aviv, the International Convention Center, managing large-scale local and international events, as well as managing the international sales and marketing and leading the way to international meetings industry for the venue. Tamara was also previously the deputy chapter chair for the Mediterranean chapter of ICCA, contributing to the content of the chapter meetings as well as unity of the chapter's members. Uh, Tamara, welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much for accepting uh, our invitation for this interview. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Thanks. So uh, we have been speaking about a new reality in the business events industry after COVID-19. Can you tell us any strategies that associations and business events professionals are taking regarding operating during the pandemic, solutions adopted, and how the industry sees its activity when we are able to host on-site events again? So the first thing that um, I have to say about the reopening and how are we adapting is I think that most events professionals would answer the same and they would tell you that hybrid is here to stay. Um, I think that we will see in the next coming years that these hybrid events and these new formats will stay with us. Will it be in the same scope as they are now? It's hard to know, but we do know that some elements will stay with us long term. Um, usually we know that crisis brings on a need for change and rethinking what we knew and adapting to new realities and changes are good. Uh, sometimes we're not fully prepared. I think this was the case when this crisis um, hit us all very hard. And in March, when all of Europe and the rest of the world was starting to shut down. But I think that if for the first few months, everyone was dealing with how do we change? How do we adapt? What are we doing? Um, everyone was talking and having conversations about the situation. I think that now looking into 2021, both the suppliers in the industry, as well as the associations have more experience. And I think they have a better understanding of these new formats. I think that um, it's been a blessing in disguise, if you could say so, because we have really seen a lot of transformation take place in the industry. And the thing now going into 2021 and looking at the industry long term is that we can actually plan for what is going to happen next year. Um, and at ICA, I can tell you that what I am doing for my region of Europe I am trying to plan for as many hybrid meetings or small regional uh, hubs that can take place in certain cities where the situation is allowing for gatherings and then have other people join virtually. And I know that associations have also um, taken to this format. And I think that one of the things that we have also seen over the past few months, and this will stay with us um, for 2021, is that associations are also rethinking the way that they do things and their RFPs and what are they requiring when they uh, present a bid to the destinations. And it's really been um, an interesting experience to see how it's together in this discussion and tries to find solutions together as an industry rather than just you know, we used to do things in such a very simplified way. There was an RFP coming from the association, the destinations would present a bid, and then everyone would go through the same process. And now I think there's more of an open discussion. Associations want to hear 
what destinations and venues are doing and venues and destinations and PCOs and suppliers want to know what destination, what the associations are needing. So it's almost like there's never been such an open discussion between all of these different elements and parts in the industry. So I do see it again as a form of a blessing, even though we have all gone through a really terrible eight months. Yes, I agree. Like this periods of crisis allow for innovation, as you say, and I, I personally think that the hybrid format will enrich the sector a lot because it will allow people for to to get more people together, even if some of them are attending online to events. And I think that is going to be really, really beneficial for the sector. So, um, so the um, ICCA created in partnership with AIPC and UFI a good practice. Uh, guide addressing COVID-19 requirements for reopening business events. Can you give us some insight into it and let our uh, listeners know where they can find more information, please? Absolutely. So ICA, AIPC and UFI, um, as you might call ourselves the G3, mm -hmm. uh, we collaborated in May of 2020 and uh, we created a good practice guide. Now, the objective was of this guide was to share a new global guide um, on the crisis to identify and promote the way of standards and pro protocols for recovery. And in fact, what we tried to do was to gather all the information from these three associations who serve different sectors, but the same sectors in some way, because ICA really has um, the membership is, is inclu inclusive of all sectors. So we have venues, we have destinations, we have convention centers and exhibition centers, we have PCOs. AAPC is more focused on convention centers, while UFI is more focused on exhibition centers. But we were all dealing with the same crisis. We were all kind of shut down. We, we saw our members really struggling. Nobody could move forward with any of their events and their activities. So what we wanted was to share with our members, um, with our suppliers and our associations community, all the information that we could gather uh, in order to have, gain some clarity on what they can do, how they can do, when they can do this in order to prepare for the reopening. Um, and this set of guidelines is actually available to anyone in the industry on the ECA website. So um, it can be accessed quite easily. Um, I will just say that later on in August, we actually went back as the G3, uh, these three sister associations, and we approached members from the three associations, asking them to share case studies on what they have done and how have they been preparing for reopening. Because if you remember, it was around July and August that things were looking very optimistic. It was before this second wave. Mm -hmm. One was trying to think positively at September and October, thinking that by then we will be able to reopen. And what we did was um, in August, we actually approached these members and we asked them to share some best practice and some case studies. And we collected this information as a follow up um, publication. And it included a lot of information about venues who are using new technology, who are implementing state-of-the-art studios in their venues and enters to still allow for these meetings to take place. Um, because as you know, way back in February and March, when associations and meetings were being postponed into late 2020, we were still very positive thinking that these events would take place on site. But then around summertime, I think everyone realized that, okay, this is not going to go away so quickly and we need to adapt. So it was pretty amazing to see that all these venues and destinations and PCOs started working with state-of-the-art technology, whether these are um, special studios that they can use to have hybrid meetings, or, uh, formats that allow for people to interact we have really tried to gather all this information together as three associations who serve available online. It's just an easy search and you can access this information. Well, this is uh, great. Uh, hello, Tamara. 
Look, uh, going back to the to the um, conference, to the Congress, the ICA, the IGA Congress mm -hmm. uh, 2020, uh, was held uh, mainly online. This hybrid experience, isn't it? But uh, uh, how can you maybe, in short, uh, tell us about what uh, were the main differences between all the other editions and this one? How did you experience this, like a person in charge of, of your situation? I mean, <laughs> yeah. So the Congress normally would take place um, in a different destination every year. And for four or five days, we normally would gather between 800 to 1,000 attendees, sometimes even more. Um, this year, we made a decision quite early on in May that we need to adapt and we need to create a new format. Um, we did a hybrid meeting. So what we did uh, was have regional hubs and every region um, in ICA had a regional uh, hub, which means we had small local meetings that allowed for people to still attend on site. So we had around 50 people in Cape Town uh, for the African members. We had around 50 people in Malaga in Spain. We had another hub in Luxembourg. We had one in Riyadh. We of course had the main Congress still take place in Kaohsiung, so we had around 300 people on site there. But the rest, as you said correctly, joined virtually, so they connected online. Um, I think that the first thing that comes to mind was that the technical aspect was not easy. We needed to adapt the format. We needed to live stream. Um, all the different regional hubs were sharing content, and they all had live streams of speakers. We needed to connect all these different destinations. Um, we also needed to find the added value for attendees who could not attend in person. So by doing this for the first time, we really needed to come up with an interesting format, still allowing people who are not on site to have that sense of engagement, of community. And we needed to be very creative about the networking opportunities and still find the ways that people would feel that they are part of um, the plus side was that it was a record-breaking year in terms of the ECO because you can probably imagine that when you are um, a CVB or a venue and you want to attend a congress and you have to travel, you would normally budget for one or two people maximum if you're traveling to the other side of the world and paying for accommodation, et cetera, et cetera. This year, it was easier to register five or six or eight people from your company, and we had 1,500 attendees, um, which is really groundbreaking for ICA. Um, we had 200 associations, we had um, 200 speakers. I mean, it was really something that we had never done before, and we were very proud of ourselves to achieve that. Um, I think that the most important thing to remember when you are experiencing going from a live event to a hybrid, and this is the biggest piece of advice that I would give anyone listening, is that hybrid cannot be copy-paste format from a live event. You cannot do that. You cannot just take the format that you are used to and copy it on to uh, a Zoom platform for that matter. You really need to be creative. You really need to be innovative and you need to just keep thinking outside the box in ways that you never thought that you would push your creativity. Um, so it was a great experience for all of us working on it. Okay, so in spite of this 2020 uh, strange year and the pandemic and so on, uh, I mean, it was a success and the, yeah. your goals in terms of participation and and so on were like copies. I mean, that's really good. Yes, it was <laughs> fantastic. It was a great success. That's right. That's great. And uh, um, so maybe this is for you, Jab. Is if I ask you about uh, what is the um, the biggest impact of this year's conference, maybe you will say that is related to this, to the enormous participation that you that you that you could have with to this. So. Oh, it was a few things. I think that there was, of course, um, an impact on reaching more attendees, as you said. But I think there was also um, a great feeling of community and being connected more than ever, but also raising the awareness to the meetings industry. Because this year, 
the way that we spread out the uh, Congress in various destinations, we actually were able to reach uh, many local politicians and governmental officials who really were supporting us in our efforts and they were recognizing the importance of events and of meetings. And it showcased the power that we have as an events industry on our local communities, on our economies, on the knowledge that we have and that we share. Um, we had the Prime Minister of Luxembourg who spoke during the Congress and it was live streamed to all the attendees. We had the Mayor of Malaga and the Andalusia Tourism Board support us and uh, attend the meetings. We had the South Africa Ministry of Tourism. So I think it was really um, a game changer for us this year. Another great impact that I think that this Congress this year had was the opportunity um, to connect people for a very long time before the Congress. So what we did was we had a six year, a six, sorry, six, six week program um, and it led up to the Congress. And during these six weeks, we had webinars and discussions and we engaged all of our members in creating what we call the Kaohsiung Protocol. Now, this is a crowdsourcing framework, and it is a set of trends and strategies and approaches in the industry um, toward reopening, toward recovery. But eventually, uh, these are supposed to be a set of very valuable, long-term strategies to be used in the industry. And we saw this as a really incredible opportunity to really engage members way before the Congress. Because as I started and said, Normally, you would attend the Congress for four or five days, you know, you get together, you attend some sessions, and you go back and you take back whatever you experienced during those days. But this time, it was like a very long process, and it gave so many members the opportunity to share their thoughts, their ideas, but also afterwards, use all this knowledge as a great source of information uh, coming from all different sectors, from all different regions, and, and exemplifying um, that we can, as an industry, have an impact on the way that we approach our government and our communities. So I think, I think there was a lot of long-term impact there this year. Great, and uh, finally, uh, regarding the online events, I mean, uh, there are already exhibitions around the world that have been developing this online in some way or another, but how far do you think that we are from a future where these online events could, uh, could really replace the real face-to-face -face events? Do you think that you are close to this moment? Do you think that the technology is not enough yet? Maybe you think that it's not about the technology, uh, but it's about the relationship between human beings? I don't know. What do you think about this? It's you're spot on. It's about relationships between human beings. Nothing can replace live face-to-face -face human interaction. And I think that if you ask anyone in our industry um, from any sector, they will tell you that there is something that happens to us when we attend a live event. It's not just about the business opportunities and the networking. It's about entering the room, being surrounded by people that you know for years and that you are used to seeing year and year over again. It's about seeing these people and hearing the sounds and feeling that energy. And I think that nothing can replace that, no matter how fantastic you can manage a hybrid or a virtual event. When you are sitting in front of your computer for two days or one day or one hour, trying to get that same experience that you would have by attending an event, it's not the same. People need to meet. Um, so I don't think that this will ever replace live events, but I think that it will, the hybrid format will complement live events and it will add another layer of depth and content and experience. But um, at the end of the day, I think we're a very resilient industry. And as soon as we will be able to go back to live events, we probably will gradually. Um, and we also know that the virtual events don't have the same impact on destinations and they can't drive the same impact economically, socially. It's not the same influence. So I think that everyone in this industry, the venues, the destinations, the PCOs, were all so eager to going back to having those events where we can create legacy, where we can um, 
you know, have an impact on the destination that is long standing. So it's not just about meeting and being together. It's also about how do we actually create something that is that is that we are leaving behind for for the places that we touch and the people that we meet. We are really glad to listen to this, uh, isn't it, Monica? Like to have yeah. her this, this same feeling. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and we all have the same feeling, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, and uh, so related to this, like uh, business events are being considered as extremely important for the economic recovery of destinations post uh, COVID 19. Mm -hmm. what, are of the, what are the views of ICA regarding this subject? Well, we agree and we know that there is an immense long-term economic impact on the destinations when it comes to these business events. Um, we have been very supportive of any advocacy effort that has been made over the past six or seven months. Um, ICA has over a thousand members from over a hundred countries who have been affected by the situation. Uh, we've been in touch with them day in, day out since the COVID outbreak. Um, but I think more than that, we are part of a big industry and a very important industry and we know that we can drive education and difference and social connection and economic impact and legacy um, so we do support this view that um, the recovery and the reopening as an as an industry will have a big impact on destinations again um, and I also think that you know when we when we look at recovery and reopening we know that it's not going to happen overnight. We know that we are going to have to really take it as a gradual process because you know some meetings and some associates are talking about re re um, having their meetings start again take place as live events 22 or 2023. So it's obviously not going to be overnight. But I think that when we can start having these small meetings and grow and grow and grow, um, we will not only be contributing in the uh, impact that we have on the destination, but I think also as an industry, we will be reading ourselves that we can do it. And this is also why when we launched this new format for the ECA Congress and we did these small regional hubs, it was so important for us to engage the local community because we were just thinking the whole time, well, if we don't do this, who will? I mean, we need to prove to the industry. We need to prove it to our members. We need to prove it to ourselves. It's almost like we needed to really see it happen to believe that you can actually have meetings take place again. And we can do it. We can do it in a safe way. We can do it in a gradual way. Um, but we will definitely have a huge impact on destinations starting from just the simple economic fact that cities will be enjoying tourism again, and to all of the knowledge and the fact that we have so much, um, such a responsibility for long-term education, um, for people who are engaging in so many different sectors and fields, and we need to uh, allow for this to keep happening. So absolutely, we are supporting this view. That's great, thank you so much. So our final question, and so this topic of uh, recovering of, of destinations post COVID-19 is very important for sustainability of the sector and also for the destinations. Mm -hmm. So in which ways can business events contribute to, to sustainability of cities and communities where they are held? Oh, well, the sustainability mm -hmm. is, um, it's been like such a buzzword going around the industry for a long time. And I personally am very, um, I'm a great believer in sustainability. And this is a process that started in our industry. Um, and I feel that it has almost been accelerated um, because of COVID, because events going hybrid. And, and we know that this format will stay with us for a while. So it's a big contribution to sustainability. You know, the world came to a standstill a few months ago with planes barely flying and not producing all the waste that we were uh, attending a big event. But having said that, I think we also have to keep in mind that once we actually go back to the live events and when we start the recovery, 
we need to be aware of the fact that as an industry, we will still have that responsibility to maintain the sustainability. We will need to rethink what we are doing. We will need to maybe come up with new models. So I do think that we will see a shift happen in the next couple of years in terms of the business events being more localized and more regional. I think that um, it will be a question of what do we do and how do we still allow for sustainability to be preserved when global events reemerge and we go back to those you know, long haul flights and having those huge gatherings. But it's been really inter interesting to see how the sustainability has um, shifted because again, you know, not being able to have these live events and live meetings, everything kind of stopped. So of course we are um, creating a lot more sustainability in the cities and in the communities, but it will be interesting to see how do we actually maintain this? And there are so many organizations and so many game players in our industry who are now addressing this issue more and more. And again, I think that the COVID crisis forced us to take a very hard look at ourselves as, as an industry and see how we can actually promote certain aspects of what we are doing, what we are not doing, um, values that we might believe in, but we're not doing well enough. And sustainability is absolutely one of them. So I think that we will see more things happening. And for ICA, I can definitely tell you that we are trying to engage in more sustainability projects for 2021. So this is something that we are uh, working on for next year. And we're very excited to see what can happen and where it can go. Oh, that's, that's great. It's for me, like speaking with you today feels very um, motivating <laughs> because like, <laughs> We started, Shabi and I were, are doing a master, master's degrees, mine is in business events management. And then I was, I'm absolutely loving it. But at some point, like when COVID started, I was like, oh my God, now we are studying these in the industries. Uh, <laughs> but then like I listen, know. listening to you makes things like see, seem like very um, way more positive. So that is really good. <laughs> Everything is really good oh, to hear well, from someone, thank from you, someone who, who knows the industry thank way better than us. So, well, thank you so well, much. Well, I think there is, I just have to say that there is a lot of positivity right now mm -hmm. um, with talking about the vaccine and our members, um, you know, they've been saying we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that it is very true and very accurate, you know, because mm -hmm. we were all kind of sucked into this vacuum for the past seven or eight months and just kind of, you know, grabbing our heads and thinking, oh my goodness, what's going to happen to us? But seeing 2021 as the year where there will be a vaccine and we will start to re- emerge and reopen. There is a lot of positivity and, and that is a message that I do need to share with anyone who is listening. Um, our members, ECA members feel the same way. I'm sure that members of other associations and other organizations are feeling the same. So I think we just need to hang on and you know keep pushing. We're a very, very strong industry. We're very resilient. We're very smart. We're very united. And that is something that I think we all have to just keep reminding ourselves day by day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. It was really, really great to, to meet you. Absolutely, absolutely great and, and inspiring. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Donna. thank very you much. Both. Thank you so much. <laughs> so thank you so much everybody for listening to this second episode. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, such as we are the Business Events Podcast. And get in touch if you would like to be a guest in our podcast too. Our email is info at thebusinesseventspodcast.com. See you soon. <laughs>